Good afternoon, no? everyone. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a bit jet lagged, uh, so I'm sorry if I uh, if I stay in blank in some point. Uh, just please, Apollo, uh, give me give me some some seconds. It sh should be fine. Uh, my name is Thomas Diaz. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself uh, in a bit. Uh, you can follow some of our work uh, at the Fab City Global Initiative at Fabla Barcelona and at the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia in the in the accounts that are mentioned there. Um, but yeah, I have different hats. Um, one of them has been uh, putting in motion FabLab Barcelona. Uh, again, it's, it's kind of FabLab number 10. Uh, currently, there are like 2,000 FabLabs in the world. Um, um, out of FabLab Barcelona, I started uh, together with colleagues, uh, the Fab City Global Initiative, uh, which is another hat. Uh, I'm also uh, leading together with other colleagues a master program called Mastering Design for Emerging Futures. Um, and uh, I have a, you know, a hat of an urbanist. I, I did my studies in urbanism, so everything that I'm going to mention is a little bit of a mix of all, all, all this uh, and some of the reflections, um, especially around the idea of designing emerging futures. No? So um, I'm going to tell you which is my one of the kind of emerging future that I imagine, and then I see like at right now we are receiving signals that it seems to be leading to this direction. In one hand, we have, um, you know, our current production model or productive model is based on a 200 year old model. Uh, uh, industrialization uh, provided us with uh, a lot of commodities, but also we understand that some of the externalities that were not visible when we were only a couple billion humans in the world are now becoming major problems at the global scale, right? Uh, I think there is no secret that we have some um, hardcore problems uh, related with climate change, basically based on the current rates of production and consumption, and especially because we are organized around like a very linear model, profit-driven, uh, with no consideration of anything else but GDP, right? Um, on the other hand, um, we have some political situations and also some health situations that are inviting us to rethink the way we organize globalization, right? So this idea that everybody moves everywhere, uh, also goods move everywhere around the world, is based in one hand on cheap oil, cheap labor, uh, and cheap access to raw materials, which actually are based on other externalities that I will explain in a bit. But they are being threatened, these very principles of, of globalization, thanks to the new forms of nationalism that are emerging uh, in Western democracies, and, and actually in one of the most powerful democracies in the world, at least in the marketing says that. And on the other hand, uh, the current threats of, 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 of the pandemic that we're living, so to speak, pandemic we're living, uh, is also inviting us to rethinking about this kind of interconnectedness. Um, anyways, um, I am from Venezuela, actually. Uh, so I come from a you know, double colonized country, uh, both by the Spanish and then as in many other countries in Latin America by the United States. I think we shared that past here as well. Um, and, but also we had the tallest uh, waterfall in the world. Um, I moved to Barcelona like 14 years ago, uh, which is the home of the best football team in the world. <laughs> no, Ria? Uh, <laughs> Uh, but also the home of, of Gaudí, for instance, uh, and of amazing design and amazing architecture. Uh, and I'm in love with Indonesia. And that's, that's myself in, in one of my boards that I brought. <laughs> uh, and hopefully I'm going to be there next week. But um, if I tell you this today, it's like a, you, you can tell me, like, a, really, are you, are you kidding me? Uh, Venezuela is being occupied by the 21st century socialism in the hands of a very authoritarian regime. Uh, Barcelona is being the victim of its own success, uh, being not only culturally, culturally threatened by the tourism, by the massive tourism, but also is you know the pollution that the air that you breathe in Barcelona is toxic, literally. I can tell you. Uh, and then Indonesia is just welcoming not only people but all the plastic in the world, right? Um, so yeah, this is where we live today. The context has changed, you know? Uh, the world as we know it is not the one that we can positively think about it. And I'm not just inviting you to be pessimistic, but I'm just telling you that like, at the starting point of any design intervention, action, should acknowledge this. We're in a different context, and this does, and is, isn't gonna fix any more 
by a product that can be sold in high prices in a lot of people or a visually attractive product or a desirable product. It's not anymore what matters that. Context has changed people, you know? Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is our context today, you know? Uh, I see some people, some people, I don't know if they're cats or people in the room. Um, you know, um, yes, global warming is a reality. If you are a climate denier, uh, probably you should think about if this is your room. Um, in our current context, we operate under the addiction to certain things. One of them is oil, apart from sugar and other stuff. Uh, oil is something that we're very <coughs> addicted to and it's only been with us just over a century. Um, I was telling you before that in order to keep cheap oil, cheap raw materials, cheap labor, you need very strong men in power controlling populations, controlling those prices for the rest of us to consume in exchange of uh, GDP, probably, no? or good reports uh, from some of the multilateral organizations. So yes, uh, our current production model is based on authoritarianism, believe it or not. Um, because there are, as I was saying, no, there are things behind, you know, our phones in this room and our cameras and our shoes and the clothes we wear that are really so, uh, sustained by these externalities that are hidden. And we're part of this, right? Like, uh, um, we can understand any other diet that is not based on animal killings, for instance. We cannot understand not wearing those things or, or using that technology that is super fast or super high quality cameras and so on and so on. So we are embedded on it. I think it was mentioned before that it's not just only from the point of view of the producer, but it's also the consumer that is demanding for these these products and, and, and these designs. So we are we're kind of being part of our own trap. We're trapping our own trap, right? And then there is something about um, I was saying I was showing you before how we live in a linear model in which we move materials around the world. But most of these materials are moved inside cities. So cities are these, you know, is the, they, are these, they are the places that attract uh, or that kind of a, where most of the people live nowadays in the world. Uh, and it's not only cities, but it's the urban living. No? Right now, you don't have to live in a city to have an urban way of living, meaning like having access to Wi-Fi, computer, the, 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 the clothes you wear, and so on. Uh, but it means that all these materials, they go inside cities. We process these materials. It could be food, it could be shoes, it could be, again, furniture, anything. We use them, we turn them into trash, and this trash goes again to our water streams, to our air, uh, and to our soil. And we end up eating it again. Then you, eat it, then you end up having microplastics uh, in your oysters, and so on, right? Um, so then the, the way, the, the thing is that, you know, the, the, ref the main reflection here is like, a, can cities be forever these places that consume products and produce trash? They can continue operating under, under this paradigm that is called product in, trash out. Or can we think about cities that are able to recover this capacity to supply people with, most, with almost everything that they need? Right? And, and I think that one of the things that we, we possibly think about is like a, the, the recent empowerment of with technology of people, especially in the world of Fab Labs, and I'm going to go deeper into this, gives the opportunity for everyone to become a change, uh, agent, of, an agent of change. Uh, the question is if, if we are ready to be that, or if we're going to have the next superhero to save us. Would it be white, black, mixed, from the north, from the south, from a colony or a colonizer? Um, we will be able to deal with the extra complexity that we have today, which is the emergence of more complex systems and technology like artificial intelligence, uh, and use it to, our, to free ourselves or to increment our dependency on technology. Jack Ma is, is, a, is very positive, by the way. Uh, and everyone else, I mean, from the Current race to elections of the United States, I think like uh, there is no hope in the in that generation, and the question is if we, the intermediate generation, are going to be able to do something or lead it to this generation. Um, 
these questions I don't have the answer to. Um, but I have some ideas. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this one. Um, what I do know is that we have increased uh, the temperature in the world based on the emissions of CO2 thanks to the current addiction to fossil fuels that creates this very much CO2, right? Um, what I know also is that, you know, based on Stuart Brandt's graphic of the, the, the base layering of, of the, you know, the soft to the hardest layering, this kind of a, the base layering of how long does it take for things to change, right? So you can, you can think about like a, the time frame, right? These variations you know, in commerce and in infrastructure and in governance and culture. So it takes nature long, you know, lo supposedly it takes longer for nature to change. And for fashion or for instance, or food, it takes quicker, uh, smaller um, or a shorter uh, time to change. But this, I don't think that this is fixed anymore. Uh, I think we're gonna see right now that nature is gonna do this, right? We're, gonna, we're starting to see that the, it becomes less predictable. Everything becomes less predictable. So I've been talking about context. Uh, I want to talk about also about convergence. Um, um, computers used to be the size of this room uh, around 50 years ago. Uh, this is the size of a, I think it's like a five, 500 bytes of information, a few decades. Your pocket, your your the phone, your phone, the, the you know your pocket now has a supercomputer that could be able to take some people to the moon. Uh, it's more powerful than the computer that was used in the in the Apollo missions. Um, we're able. I think there is not only the technology. When you say technology, I'm not thinking just about like a silicon-based technology or digital technology, which is based on the use of current and, and the change of between ones and zeros, but it's also this other more complex form of technology, for instance, our ability to use CRISPR to modify organisms and create uh, glowing plants uh, or to grow, uh, in some points, uh, um, organs in other uh, living beings. The capacity to edit our own genome and what it could lead us to. Uh, probably if you read Harari, you might be familiar with it. Uh, um, and then for me, the more interesting part is when you think about all these dimensions of technology uh, that is starting to, com to converge and the potential of, an, at, at least there is a promise that it hasn't been accom accomplished yet, which is the capacity to organize all the information and all these capabilities around a transparent, non-corruptible, distributed, non-hierarchical system, which is, again, the, the promise of blockchain which is not a reality yet and is, is far from it uh, still. But we need to think about like, uh, similarly to the early 20th, earliest 20th century, when for instance, we, invent, we invented wireless communications, we discovered the capacity of oil, the assembly line was introduced, produced the world as we know it today. So it was a moment of convergence. Another mom moment of convergence when, when the, at least for us in, 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 in South America, when, when the Spanish arrived to the New World, but it was the same century in which the printing press was invented. It was a, a, a very powerful tool to spread knowledge, you know? So we are living in another moment of convergence in which the complexity that we're adding is, is incredible because in most of these, these things, we know a lot of myths, and we're really far from knowing intrinsically how and the AI algorithm that runs your Google Maps works, and so on and so on, right? So one of the things that for sure is changing as well in this moment of convergence is the access, and I, and I mean the access to information and the access to tools, right? As, again, as a Stuart Brand will say it, I don't know if you're familiar with the whole Earth catalog, but same thinking just 50, 60 years ago. Um, but this is a new type of access, <laughs> right? Um, right now in this room, there are more devices than people. <laughs> right? Right now in this room, there are devices that can handle more complex information 
that all the people in this room, believe it or not. But still, for now, we still have the decision power over those devices. And I cannot, I cannot promise you uh, to tell you for how long. <laughs> Actually, there are people that somehow, that's, you know, this is a comedian uh, that says uh, that if someone looks from outer space to what, 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 what it's not a comedian. Actually, no, it's Seinfeld, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with Seinfeld, it's a comedian. He made a joke about if uh, people from outer space look at us from outer space and they look people in New York walking behind the dogs, you know, handling them, and then the, the dog poops, and then the human will pick up the poop, and then he, the, the aliens will ask who is in charge, who is on charge, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if you look at people in the streets with their mobile phones, this, this is Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, an astrophysicist uh, you probably are familiar with. He says, like, uh, if people look at us, <laughs> from out space, or other living beings look at us, other intelligence look at us from other space, they will look at us taking, doing what our phones tell us to do, right? And we would, we still say, who is in charge, right? He also says that if there is a most intelligent, which, which could happen in this moment of convergence, it sounds very crazy, but as crazy as it sounded, that when some people went to sail away and found other people in the other part of the world, um, as crazy as it would, it would be to say we will find most intelligent or some other more intelligent forms would find us. Neil deGrasse Tyson said that it would be a very bad news for us because every time that one civilization that was more technically advanced than other one, it created new forms of slavery, right? But then, uh, in this moment of convergence, um, we have more access, underutilized access. Right, uh, we have super powerful computers, but uh, in our pockets. But we use it to Instagram. We use it to maybe send some emails. But we barely use it for, with all the capacities that they have. And this has happened like a very fast, as I said before. Um, the access, you know, believe it or not, in the 60s, uh, and there was one of the founding members of Intel that predicted that computers will become faster and cheaper every. Uh, twice faster and half cheaper every between 28 and, and 18 and 28 months. That was Gordon Moore. Um, and that somehow happened. But right now we're looking at, like now with the introduction of quantum computing, that law, that, law, that predictable law is going to disappear again. And actually there are some advancements in, current, in modern computation that uh, somehow is challenging that predict predictable model of how technology would evolve, right? So one of the things we know as well is like a weekend where can predict uh, less than we used to do uh, before. Sorry, I'm again kind of sleepy. So this is another type of access, and this is how a Fab Lab looks like. Uh, so if you have a super uh, computer in your pocket, imagine that you have a super factory in your neighborhood. That's the idea of a Fab Lab. And not just to a place to manufacture things, but actually to learn about manufacturing things, to learn about materials, to learn about how things are made, and how to, com by combining technologies that are not super new, by the way, uh, you know, large format machining, the first CNC machine was connected to a computer in the 40s, last century, in the, the, in the late 40s. A computer was invented in the early 40s, and then was connected for the first time to a computer control, control machine. And then all of the machines that we use today are depending on that same technology, more or less. 3D printing was invented in the late 70s, early 80s. So we are not talking about like a super new technology. We're changing the, first of all, like uh, the applicability into certain industries and also the access to it, right? And what Fab Labs have been doing so far is like uh, this idea of sharing a common inventory about the different processes that in its, is inside in one of these laboratories, as well as the philosophy of, you know, the open collaboration and the sharing knowledge and using it for good and not to manufacture weapons and so on has been spreaded as well as part of the inventory, let's say, the values embedded into it. Um, and similarly to the, to the law of Gordon Moore, we have studied the last 10 years of evolution of Fab Labs, and there, surprisingly, they have been duplicated, they have been duplicating every, between every 18 and 24 months in the last 10 years. So we went from 10 Fab Labs, more or less, in 2007 to almost 2,000 nowadays. And this is how it looks today. Right, so I showed you uh, behind each one of these dots, the, the map, 
There are places that are not exactly the same, but that share most of the processes that you can find in one of these places. So it means that if I 3D print something here in northern Brazil, I can send the file to Lingen in Norway without having to put it in a shipping container, right? Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Fabla Barcelona. Well, wow, that's a lot of time still. Cool. So, um, which is. Yeah. Is that 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 early? Are you asking that? Can you do you allow me to continue and unpack it? I'm already. This is the introduction. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. When I finish, if you have the same question, I'm happy to to have it and to bring it to the to the public. So Fabla Barcelona. And, I, I want to, uh, uh, and again, in this idea of unpacking what, what I'm trying to say, it's a place that I know by first hand because I helped it to set up uh, uh, in 2007. Uh, um, I've been leading somehow the evolution of this Fab Lab, not as a place to make things only, but actually as an innovation center that gives not only the tools, but also the culture about making, the change of culture about making, and the perception about the use of technology. Um, we are located, one of the, 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 the interesting facts is that we are located in an old uh, industrial zone of Barcelona. As many other cities in the world, the industry has left the country. Um, so we are occupying a former metal factory. Uh, and then as part of the institute, we also acquired a, a new campus, which is like a new campus, which is located 20 minutes from the center of Barcelona. And it used to be part of an old uh, farm that serve some of the food for some of the markets in the city. So in the places where we are today, operating as a kind of places of where we, we, where we learn with our students, with our researchers, and so on, kind of reflects the flaws itself that like I was mentioning at the beginning. So like the cities have lost their capacity to produce uh, what they need in terms of food and in terms of, of its own technology. So this is some of the evolution facts of, of our lab, but more interesting is like how we have somehow organized the, it's kind of the idea of convergence of technology uh, in one hand, which somehow synthesizing into, into more specific areas of knowledge that we work as, as, a, as a research and innovation laboratory, and not only as a makerspace to make things just to make, right? And these are the idea of productive cities, which is you know, claiming the, this, uh, or making the claim that cities need to, need, need to recover the capacity to produce locally what they need, the idea of sense making, which is using sensing technologies to capture the invisible uh, and also making sense out of the invisible information that is not uh, obviously available for us. Uh, the idea of distributed design, uh, which is also changing from the notion of design something, patenting, making China, ship it around the world, but actually think about how distributed design uh, can be the, um, develop it within, not only with the Fab Lab network, but, but other, uh, through other infrastructures. The notion of uh, understanding that learning changes when you learn by doing, when you learn it connectedly, when you, when you create the spaces of learning and, don't, and not spaces to educate people. Again, which is a very um, kind of a traditional way of understanding how you learn is when someone educates you. Uh, ecological interactions with deals with how we connect with nature and natural systems, materials and textiles in which we are connecting with the fashion industry, but also from the even from the material level and developing biomaterials, and emerging futures, which is about uh, starting to create today, not only through speculation, but actually through interventions in the real world, the, these emerging futures that uh, we believe are possible um, through the new capacities we have. So in our lab, we have done some work in the past uh, with the European Union, and also at the moment, uh, we are doing more than, or ha we have been a part of projects that all together they put more than 85 million euro in, in, in research and development. And we have collaborated with some companies in the past as well. This is the founding day uh, in uh, 2007. Uh, this is Neil Gershenfeld, one of uh, the accidental father of Fab Labs, uh, um, the head of the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT. First, one of the first workshops we did was teaching kids how to make. This is one of our first uh, 
big projects done for the Venice Biennale uh, in 2008, the Venice Biennale of Architecture. We produced an entire installation of 300 square meters of interconnected objects in a simulated room uh, as a way to show how the world operates at different scales, even at the domestic, uh, from the domestic level. This is the meeting in which we were launching the FAO Academy program. I will talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, this is our entire house that we have developed and made in the Fab Lab. Uh, this house is made out of a design that can, is parametric, so it changes depending on where it is located in the world. If you are closer to the equator, it will be flatter. If it's closer to the pole, it needs to be more like an egg because it takes advantage of the surface of, of the sun path in order to generate energy for the house itself. Um, a more recent project, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders as well, is a low-cost sensor device uh, to allow people to capture information about the city pollution and then share it openly. So what it does is actually provide citizens the capacity to address uh, environmental issues in their cities and not just put it in the hands of governments or, or, or companies, as it has been happening with the smart city approach uh, recently. This is a moment in which, uh, together with the mayor of Barcelona, we launched the Fab City Global Initiative, and I hope I have time uh, to get to these points. Uh, I probably will cut it to address the questions. Um, and this is one of, uh, one of the recent projects that we have done for, for a local restaurant. We designed it and manufactured and reconceptualized the idea of a restaurant of the 21st century. They have all, the, all their food is available locally, they, they, so they source their food, their food locally. And also we say that if you, you're sourcing the food locally, you should also source the restaurant locally as well. Uh, and it should be at the same time open source. So you go to the restaurant, which has, is a, has been made two blocks from, from what it is. You can download the design of the, of the furniture. And again, it's just, these are projects that are manifestos itself, right? Of how are these, uh, again, idea of emerging futures can be manifested uh, in the reality. So then, uh, again, I talk about uh, context, uh, convergence, uh, learning, uh, uh, sorry, context convergence and access. Uh, that give us opportunity, uh, and I kind of introduced it already, is, uh, um, to change the way uh, we understand learning. Um, and basically, uh, you probably remember uh, this image. Yes, the wall, uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall movie. Uh, we don't need no education. Um, so this idea of learning uh, beyond, uh, and I want to be emphatic on this, on the educators and the educated, right? It's creating spaces to learn. Um, so I was, since I'm, I'm continuing the thread of, of the Fab Labs as this starting point of, of these opportunities, I want to tell a little bit um, how out of a, a class at MIT, in which probably is the, high, the, the most reputed educational institute in the world, um, how out of this class, how to make almost anything, Fab Labs started by accident. No? This is a class taught by Neil Gershenfeld, in which you cover in, in, in just about uh, three months, um, you know, all the processes that you need to learn in order to make almost anything, from how to make a, 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 a program a circuit board, to how to learn how to 3D print, how to use the develop composite materials and so on, and you integrate everything into projects. So the very notion of, of, of this idea of Fab Labs as a way, as platforms for people to make differently started somehow out of this, out of this class. The problem with this class is that in order to access to it, you have, you have to be enrolled in the, at MIT. And then MIT, uh, it's, as you know, is one of the most expensive uh, universities, not only in the United States, but in the world. Um, you have to be brilliant. You have to be not only, you don't, have, you don't, you don't only need the money, you have to be also have the, the mental capabilities. And also, you have to have the emotional capabilities. I don't know if you had been in the MIT campus, but it's full with advertisement about, uh, that says, are you thinking on suicide? Please call us. We give you support. It's a lot of pressure at the school in order to stay there. So. <laughs> This class can only sit around 20 people. Uh, right now, actually, they have more groups, so you can sit on just close to 80 people. But what, what we did is actually with this idea of creating spaces for learning and not just institutions educating other people, is thinking about how we can make MIT obsolete by developing a learning infrastructure through Fab Labs, right? 
And the way we do that is through the FAB Academy, uh, which is a course that is not like a MOOC, it's not M-O-O-C, but it's, it's not distance learning, it's distributed learning. Meaning that there is content that you receive digitally, but it's highly connected with the idea of having access to the FAB Lab and learning through making, learning by doing, and learning not only from the professor and the contents that come in the screen, but also learning from the, your work and interaction with the, your peers in the lab, right? Um, so this is how a, a class of the FAB Academy looks like. So this is Neil teaching from his office in Boston, but he's teaching to people that they're having MIT education, quote unquote, without having to go to MIT, right? So they can have access to highly technical education in one hand without having to move their asses and be at one of the most expensive universities in the world. And then while they're doing that, it opens opportunity that using that learning process in order for them to prototype and develop new ideas, new projects that can help them to produce impact in their communities. And I'm gonna give some examples. So every year, we have, the, this year is running the 11th edition of the FAB Academy. And every year we have graduated around 200, stu 200 students more or less. So right now there are close to 2,000, 2,000 and something students graduated from this course. And then what we are seeing is that thanks that the content and all the projects of the students is documented and is available online, then the coming students, they build from the knowledge that previous students have developed. So the projects and the knowledge has increased its quality and, 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 and the capacity to not only do the almost working prototypes, but now we're having students that they're living out of the projects that they started and developed inside the FAB Academy. So one of the cases is uh, Loic and Guillaume. They started an, uh, the, the FAB Academy a couple of years ago in Barcelona, and they developed an aqu aquaponic system in which they don't sell the aquaponic system itself. So the invention is not do, you know, manufacturing and shipping uh, fish tanks with plants on top, but actually they provide off, uh, companies and, and even research centers their knowledge about developing aquaponic systems, right? Um, another example is the open source beehives, which is again a project that combines, in one hand, distributed manufacturing, mean, distributed design, meaning like a, they digitize these two very traditional, uh, for the bee, if there's any beekeeper in the, in the room, uh, you will know that these are probably some of them, two of the most used uh, beehive systems in the world. Um, they digitize it so in every fab lab, people can download the file and make the beehive. And they added another layer, which is uh, the capacity to put a sen sensors inside the beehive in order to capture data about the happiness of the bee. So they use uh, different frequencies of sound analysis so they understand what is the noise that the colony makes, also the warmth of a, of a colony inside. And then you, you can correlate that uh, data uh, with environmental data, with changes on the weather, uh, you know, with analysis of use of pesticides in certain locations. And that becomes a more powerful tool, powerful tool to understand uh, what is causing the colony collapse disorder in bees which are responsible to close to 30% of the um, food that we eat. This is another project which uh, is an interesting pro uh, approach to, you know, drones are quite known in the world and then we're using again to make great Instagrams and, video and YouTube videos, but they can be used as well to monitor agricultural fields. Uh, in this case, uh, the Nero project, which started again out of a Fab Academy project, uh, has become part of a European funded project in which we are developing tools to analyze from the using data that is captured from the soil, from inside the soil, putting sensors inside the soil, even some meters below, uh, to do, doing some topsoil analysis with a robot and collect that a robot, an autonomous robot that is collecting samples and taking pictures of the plants to Cable bots and drones that are, fly, uh, are moving on top of the crops and taking, again, samples and doing different types of analysis of images to satellite image, imagery. So you have this multi-layer, uh, di um, different layers of information that allows farmers, ideally, I mean, the, uh, again, all this knowledge is open source, allows farmers to keep having diverse um, doing diverse agriculture and not just monoculture, which is highly efficient. What happens when you have large stations of land, you want to plant one thing, 
because you put one type of machines to manage it, and then you can produce it. So it's a specialization paradigm, right? But then the, defend, the people that defend the permaculture say, okay, permaculture is great, but the people that go against permaculture say it's not efficient, right? So with the support of, I mean, this is the idealistic <laughs> scenario in which, first of all, farmers learn about the technology and they're happy to implement it and embed it. And second of all, robots and technology become, uh, you know, open and accessible for them as well, right? You can imagine that Monsanto is going gonna to be after uh, a robot like this in order to make, you know, you buy the pesticide, you buy the seeds, and you have to buy the robot in order to work with Monsanto products. Um, and this, pro this project is called Robots in Micro Farms. So the idea is develop open tools for farming communities in the world. And again, using the same principles of distributed manufacturing, open sourcing, uh, accessible technologies uh, to transform the way we interact with our natural systems. Um, another project uh, uh, that comes out of the lab is the winemakers. Uh, wine is one of the oldest technologies that we have used as humans. It's dated out of 8,000 years uh, in Georgia. Um, so we have combined sensors that we we develop inside the lab in order to monitor the process of fermentation and stabilization of the winemaking. But also we are bringing, similar to breweries in the cities, we are bringing like a wineries, new forms of winemaking inside the city uh, that allows anyone to learn how to deal not only with the technological layer of, of sensors and, and, and through making wine you can learn technology, but also learning the, the, very, the very own technology that grapes have. They are living systems, right? They, um, so you basically are negotiating with, uh, with a living system on how your wine is going to be. And this negotiation means like uh, how much oxygen you put into it, how much uh, yeast you put into it, and so on. Um, I want to, this is, uh, again, we, we combine the sensor technologies with all knowledge, also with uh, uh, the biotechnologies, and then you end up producing the most uh, expensive wine in the world. I'm saying... It's expensive because just yes, from the point of view of uh, optimization, uh, it's probably it's not it's not your, it's going to be more expensive than a very good quality wine, but also because when it's your wine, it's really expensive. Like and that's my wine, and actually I have this bottle. I had I, I use this one to test them. They were kind of okay. Uh, this one is stabilizing on top of my fridge, just waiting for my family to visit from Venezuela, and then I will share it with them. But I don't know if it will be for good or for bad. Maybe they will hate the wine, right? So then, uh, again, when going from context to convergence to access to learning, we go to design. So when, you, when I show you all these approaches of, of, of design problems, quote unquote, or design challenges, and the way that we have solved, solved them, right? Like a, Instead of having the smart city and taking the government and corporations taking care of your city, putting sensors in the hands of people to capture data, uh, learning how to make wine in order for you to learn about biotechnology and sensor technology. So these are things that are not, they're not traditional design problems, right? So um, I think there are new notions of design or, or new spaces uh, for new approaches of design that are emerging for this convergence moment and also uh, from this moment as well of not only convergence of technologies, but convergence of different crises that are coming together. And again, uh, just to introduce you to the chapter, I want to give you like a, the latest update of uh, DIY production of body and head protection against coronavirus, uh, captured from social media. <laughs> uh, these are DIY solutions for big problems, uh, um, probably taken to an extreme, right? So that seeds, this seeds in you know, this kind of a disruption, you know, like if you have a shortage of, of, of masks, just make a mask with whatever you have available, right? Um, but then that very simple notion of production actually is taking us to, to open opportunities to reinvent those systems. And that's what I was telling about moving from moving or shifting from moving materials around the world to moving information around the world for people as designers to open source it and open source open sourcing knowledge and so on. So think about you know uh, the masks that we're using for the coronavirus. When any any step on this chain is broken, 
you're done, right? And it's happening. Uh, we were, you know, we're discussing the challenges that we have right now with the coronavirus, but imagine what happens when the Amazon uh, inventories are gone out of the logistics, uh, the logistics centers, right? Um, so we're going to see some dis interesting disruptions on this traditional way of understanding supply chains, of understanding manufacturing, uh, product design, and so on. Alternatively, what we propose, again, it's not, it's not something new, but it's the idea of uh, understanding that this is circular slash, I, I like to call it spiral, because for me, circular means like a capturing certain things. I sometimes prefer to talk about spiral because somehow you leave things to evolve, no? and, and somehow that you don't, you don't create like a, the new Netflix of shoes, for instance, which is something that IDEO consultants dream about. Uh, so understanding that these separations between processes and supply chains, the designer, the manufacturer, etc., cetera, can it, cannot be separated anymore in these kind of very well-defined silos, right? Because again, disruption can happen anytime uh, because the way that we're producing today is not viable for any future of anyone or any living thing in this planet. And because somehow we have the opportunity and the, and the means to challenge the current status of things and it starts to create uh, what could be not the new, uh, I would say, the, the new way to rule the entire world, but actually a new uh, a, a space for opportunity. So when you think about this, it's like a moving in a way from the centralized, uh, you know, this model is somehow centralized or in some, some cases decentralized model. And that somehow has these externalities that I mentioned before. Uh, you know, you don't see where your IKEA furniture comes from or where it happens with the service economy, again, that everybody dreams about uh, nowadays. Uh, and understanding the hidden infrastructure, these are the Amazon logistics centers. Uh, and I wonder what's going to happen in the next few weeks uh, when shippings from China have the reduced. And then understanding that this logic operates in the very, mo in the very same logic that the internet or the, the initial internet was supposed to be, which is distributed, right? Distributing the capacities to make locally. That it is happening right now at small scale in Fablabs, but it can be scale up. Uh, with some possibilities, right? So again, what, yeah, so what? Yeah, I find fascinating, so what? That is great that someone in Lima can design something with someone in Bangalore, and then they can it can be made in Moscow. I find that fascinating. I find fascinating also to think about that it can not only happen in these dots, but actually that regions or cities are able to make obsolete their ports and then replace those ports for flexible factories and produce on demand with local materials where people need, right? So that's for me what is interesting. And then we're building somehow the digital and the physical infrastructure in order to do that, as well as the knowledge bases in order to make it happen. So I showed you some of the examples of projects before, uh, and then this is a platform in which those projects can be accessed by anyone in the world and be downloaded. So as I was saying, the people that develop these things, they are not waiting to be to manufacture these things centrally and put them in shipping containers, but they are waiting for people to copy them, right? So, and this is, I don't know if you're familiar with the Precious Plastics project, but it's one of those as well that is based on, I want you to copy me, right? And I want you to hack what I'm doing and improve it, no? So what is interesting as well is that as I, what, what I said, you know, I mentioned this before, but this idea of understanding that these fab labs are not places where people necessarily need to manufacture what they need. What is interesting when, they, when these places for learning, for community, for prototyping can connect with local capacities for manufacturing. And we understand that there's another le layer or level of infrastructure that is needed to enable this idea of distributed design and manufacturing. What I mean is that with the current if you think about that, you can supply what people need in a city with what is available in a major space of Fab Lab is, is an utopia. It's not possible. But when you think about the capacity that is already installed, for instance, in cities, the manufacturing capacity that is idle, that is not being used, then you start to find potentials because you're having people 
that are going to a fab lab. They're learning how to make things differently. They're prototyping, let's say, furniture using uh, materials out of waste. And then there is a point in which they cannot go beyond, they cannot go further because they don't have where to manufacture. So what we're trying to do is to connect with existing manufacturing capabilities in the cities. And we started to own and develop this uh, platform that we didn't start it. It was started by some colleagues in, in Scotland. But what it does is, is collects and documents and creates an inventory. I show you the inventory of processes that are in a, this in a fab lab, you know, all the 3D printing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So imagine that we scale up, and this is the inventory of a city or a region. And then when you have someone prototyping something in their makerspace in the corner, they know that they can make, you know, maybe a dozen of, of them in an industry that is, you know, just a few miles away or a few kilometers away from it, right? Um, that means also that cities, um, which used to operate, you know, as I told you, we are in a, in a building that it used to be a factory and in another building that it used to be a farm, the city needs to rethink its infrastructure. And then if in the 19th and 20th century, we have developed infrastructure to move atoms around the world because we build railways, we build ports, we advance in the, in the most advanced industries have been the uh, aeronautics or, or the car industries is because we need to move atoms. The industries that we need in the future or what, that we need right now actually, the future, <laughs> we really need, now, we need it now, there, these are industries that are staying in the cities and they allow us to keep the atoms locally and just move the bits globally. Right? These are like the pizza ovens of, that we need in the cities. What are pizza ovens? Because not all the pizzas are made in Italy and they're shipped from Italy to the rest of the world. Right? We have the capacity, the local infrastructure, the access to raw materials to make pizzas locally and we share the recipes. So it will be stupid to ship all the pizzas from Napoli. Right? It depends because if you don't, you don't want it that crunchy, you want it thicker, it should be from the north right? or the other way around. So, this is what we're saying. Like we need to think about like a, a fab lab or a maker space plays a role, but also, you know, we probably will, uh, we're starting to see that at the domestic scale, we're going to incorporate some productive capabilities inside, you know, the places that we live, right? We have social spaces for manufacturing and learning, and then we have <clears throat> larger infrastructures that allow us to, you know, enter into a, a different production model that uh, is not just Let's prototype something and let's make it in China. But it's actually, let's see what can I make locally. And probably we will need to make something in China. But the idea would be like a, at least to reduce that to its maximum capacity. I say China now, but it's going to be Africa in five years, by the way. Um, this is, um, I'm going to skip this one, but you can put the volume because the next one is going to have uh, audio. This is a project that we did with IKEA. Uh, in which we simulated that our neighborhood was a neighborhood that had the capacity to produce locally what it needs. So we bring IKEA designers, sustainability managers, and, 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 and product managers to Barcelona for a week, and we did the Made Again uh, challenge. So we made IKEA to go outside of the streets and collect the trash. I oh, know, sorry, this is muted. This is muted on purpose, yeah. yeah. Um, so we made IKEA designers to go outside the neighborhood and collect all furniture, bring it back to the local fab labs in the neighborhood, and then make new products out of it. So in some cases, the IKEA designers were collecting furniture that they designed it, <laughs> right? Because they are made to be designed to last very little, right? I think that for some IKEA owners, you know how painful is that. And then what happened is that this a promotional video came after, and this goes with, uh, can you, uh, excuse me, can you help me here to, see, because when it's, when, it's, oh, when it's playing, can you help me to go to the next one? Just hover on the screen, and then, okay, thank you. Um, this is the, kind of a, the, the launching uh, or, or kind of the, the team of, of the Made Again Challenge. So we involve IKEA designers as well as local makers and global makers. I like this. This is in a, another maker space inside the neighborhood. This is a Trojan horse, right? In a way, if you think about Fab Labs, they are like Trojan horses. And then we were able to send a message inside IKEA. And IKEA, 
it's probably the, the company that has mastered this linear production model. You remember that the claim of I IKEA was democratizing design? It's a lie. <laughs> IKEA has democratized the assembly line, <laughs> right? Uh, you actually, you use time, you go and, and collect in a storage place outside the city, you drive the flat packed furniture and you put it together in your house. You do free labor. So you think that you're buying cheap design, but actually you're doing free labor for IKEA. It's either you or someone else in some kind of country rolled by some authoritarian regime to make cheap labor. But um, then this idea of sending the message inside IKEA led to this promotional video, which I really like. Video, and now volume, put it together. Video, video, yeah. What if we could create a better everyday life for the many people? For the couples that turn into families, the children, the lovers, for the old ladies, the single ladies, the single mothers, and for those who need to start all over. What if we always side with the many by designing the price tag before anything else? What if furniture could be better for nature, better for people? What if we could make furniture out of waste? What if all glass could get new life? What if we could collect all these bottles and turn them into something else? Like this chair. What if we could plant more trees than we use? And what if we could use wood in new ways so that this tree and this tree and all of these trees could grow to be just trees? What if we turn the tables on food and make meatballs without meat? What if we turn the tables on tables and make screws that aren't screws? In fact, what if we lose the screws completely so we can put things up, take them down, and put them up again? What if we try to design new behaviors instead of new products? Better play instead of toys, and better sleep instead of beds? What if water taps could save water? And light bulbs could save light? What if all our stores could power themselves? And what if the best packaging is no packaging? What if we could make furniture out of air? What if we tried twice and failed twice? And what if we try again? What if we celebrate our differences? Because without each and every person, we wouldn't be complete. What if we never settle for an answer? What if we always ask ourselves, what if? So after that, uh, <laughs> after that, um, uh, the, that challenge with IKEA, um, or during, uh, in the preparations, it helped us to identify that in our very neighborhood that used to be an industrial neighborhood, it used to be known the Catalan Manchester, is where you know the industrial revolution started in Catalonia and in, in Spain. Uh, we started to identify that there were people like us that were occupying this obsolete infrastructure and creating new ways of making and new makers approaching waste materials and so on. For instance, um, Transfolab is a place that is called Center for, the Re uh, for Research on Trash. And they dedicate themselves on that. Uh, or Dress de No is a high street shop on 3D printing, right? Just as a coffee shop, but it's on 3D printing shop. So what we then identify is that, okay, why don't start taking this neighborhood as, a, as a, our, our new lab? You know, like a going out of the building as our, labor, as our laboratory where people is making there with the machines to understand that this only makes sense when you can make in the neighborhood as a laboratory. Um, and this, when you think about the many neighborhoods in the, in, even inside Barcelona, connected, or different neighborhoods of different cities in the world, they start to operate under, you know, somewhere around here on this idea of distributedness that I was mentioning before. This is somehow the rational. Like we got into a point in which we started to make these things and say, wait a second, we are really making happen things that are allowing us to think about the possibility of not only making futures, 
but designing emerging futures, meaning like start to think about the interventions that we can do at all levels, not only with our students, but also with companies, with kids, at all levels, to start to um, create the seeds of those emerging futures, but the emerging futures that we want and we need, right? How much time I have left? What? Okay. So uh, that emerging futures, those emerging futures start from the very fact that we live in another type of convergence, as I told you before. This is a screenshot of a tool that we have been developing inside our lab that is called the Atlas of the Weak Signals. This is Atlas of the Weak Signals. And that's the first step of the design exercise. It's understanding where you want to intervene as a designer. And these signals are not permanent. They evolve. And they connect with databases. And they are, some of them are awkward, yes. But some of them are created by our students. They're created by our, our students with our, our teaching staff. And they, we understand that this is an evolving tool, right? So this is part of this approach. I was written by the, by the U lab. And it's not the same. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's not the same at all. So <laughs> um, what, we, uh, what we understand designing for, the, the Designing for Emerging Futures exercise is embeds is, first of all, again, using that tool of the address of a weak signals to identify where you want to intervene as a designer. Then go down and design an intervention in the present, and then create speculations about possible futures that you want to create with that intervention. And those possible futures are not just speculative, uh, imaginary things, a science fiction uh, exercise in which you are detached from it, but actually it's an emerging future that you hook yourself to, to in order to make it happen. And it's not that important, the future itself, but it's actually how you get there from where you are now. And that's what we're trying to do with our, with our students by embedding all these new technologies that are part of our moment of convergence, not only digital fabrication, but also biotechnology, AI, blockchain, and then introducing these as tools for, for designers with a lot of uncertainty, to be honest, uh, but uh, with the willing of creating this learning space uh, now in a, it's in, it's an, it's an it's a master program, which is part of the formal education, but we believe that it's, it's, it's going to evolve, no? And i give you some examples. We, we are currently in the second edition of the program, but i give you some examples of what kind of projects our students do. Nicolas uh, was learning to work with um, mycelium. A mycelium is a type of, of, of mushroom. Of, of, um, it's actually used, um, it's one of, uh, uh, Richard Stamet, one of the most you know, celebrated mycologists in the world, he, he's kind of a, he believes that the, 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 the largest living being in the world is not the Great Barrier, or it wasn't the Great Barrier. Uh, it's actually a, a mycelium network. It's kind of an internet that operates in the West Coast in the, in the United States. But mycelium has a lot of properties. You can use it as a material, as a building material. You can use it as an isolation material. It grows very fast. But it has other capacities that is to biodegrade certain other materials, right? Uh, and what Nicolas from Chile found out is that like cigarette butts are one of the most polluting materials in the world, in the top five. And he wanted to do something in relation to cigarette butts. So he, the first reaction is, was saying, I think that mycelium can eat cigarette butts. But then he started to do experiments and he learned that the, mice, the, the mushrooms didn't like the cigarette butts. And what he did is that started to train the cigarette butts to like to eat the cigarette butts with nicotine, right? It's, he trained the mushroom, he trained the mycelium. And then he was, at the beginning, he was cheating the, the mushroom, giving it just cigarette filters without being used, and then little by little introducing nicotine until the mycelium liked it and then started to process it, right? One of the uh, speculative scenarios that he made is actually, what if instead of giving it cigarette butts to the mycelium, we, you start to give it with your hair and with your nails and with parts of your skin, so the mycelium starts to like you, to eat you. And in some point in the future, he would imagine that you will cultivate this mycelium, it will become like a, your pet, but at the end it will be the thing that will biodegrade you in a more sustainable way as we do now, right? So that's Nicolas' project. Gabor, Gabor was trying to create a way for fighting attention economy, meaning the amount of time that we're spending with our mobile phones. So he developed this kind of service that he wanted to introduce in restaurants in which 
you uh, you somehow leave your phone uh, in connected to a supercomputer that is trying to find extraterrestrial life. While you do that, you get some cryptocurrencies that they, you can use to pay the dinner. Uh, uh, Alexandra, uh, I have to, they tell me to wrap up, so Alexandra and also uh, Oliver, they were both developing um, uh, teaching curriculums for uh, introducing uh, synthetic biology and artificial intelligence in schools. And it's not only like they did it like from their desk, but actually they went and taught some kids and developed this, uh, these materials uh, and they are now being implemented in the, in the schools. So I need to wrap up, I've been told. I'm gonna skip this, this is too promotional. I'm gonna leave a couple of books uh, that I want to share with you. I have, I have them in my room, so I'll bring it around and I'll give it to, I guess, to the... You have Malcolm? Did I give them to you? No? Okay, uh, I'll give to Making Futures and to the British Council a couple of copies. And this is, I had two endings, but this is the... Unfortunately, I have to stay in the first ending. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tomas.